Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. If you would all just take a moment to uh, take your seats, we'd love to get the program started this evening. Thank you, thank you so much, I really appreciate that. Um, my name is Crystal Vargas and I'm serving as the uh, Executive Director for the West San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, uh, covering the Southwest, the Northwest, and the entire Western sector of San Antonio. And we're proud to be here tonight to honor our 20th District Congressman Charles Gonzalez. So we'd love to get this program started and I'd like to introduce Someone who is very close to us. Uh, we, we definitely work with different veterans associations, VFWs, but there's always this one person who is always tr true to our heart and has always been there, not only in a bind to help support the chamber and our veterans and businesses, veterans and business award that we have every year. So I'd like to announce Mr. John Rodriguez from the Commission on Veterans Affairs, District 3 representative. Mr. John Rodriguez, would you please walk up? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Post VFW Post 76 and John Rodriguez, thank you so much. We definitely appreciate you being here tonight. Will everybody please remain standing until the flags leave the room? Will we stay, oh, you'll stay for the invocation? May I have Rita Hernandez, one of our board members from Inspiration for Life radio show, please walk up here to do our invocation. Welcome. Thank you, Crystal. It's such an honor and blessing to be here today to do the invocation. Um, just a true blessing to be surrounded by amazing people of our community. And I just want to thank you all for being here. Just bow your heads. I just want to thank you, Lord Father God, for everything that you're doing for this evening, Father God. For putting your hands and blessing everybody here this evening for this 11th annual State of the District featuring Congressman Charles A. Gonzalez. For everybody that's here, Lord, that we ask that you bless us for this wonderful evening and to bless our food and to bless us as we make our journeys home safely tonight, Father God. And we thank you once again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. I'm not Crystal, you can be seated. Thank you so much.
At this moment, we'd like everyone to take a few moments to enjoy your dinner, and we'll start a program in about 15 to 20 minutes. So please enjoy.
Thank you. I hope everyone's enjoying their meal tonight provided by the El Tropicana Hotel. As you can see, they've got a wonderful venue to consider for future events. I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce our brand new chairman, Mr. Gabe Farias of the PRMP Group of Texas, which is a local marketing firm here in San Antonio. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have Gabe Farias as our chairman this year to guide and direct us in the right direction and take a more proactive uh, marketing approach to uh, the, the different things that we're working on with the chamber. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Gabe Farias. And as I promised Crystal and my wife, I will keep it real short because I'm looking at this agenda and I'm thinking, what's this idiot Gabe Farias doing speaking with such distinguished uh, individuals? Guys, thank you so very much for coming out today. I am the new chairman of the board for the West San Antonio uh, Chamber of Commerce. This is the chamber on the move. We're doing some fantastic things. Uh, both out in the community, whether it's initiating our first ever health fair or uh, you know, doing things for our members like having golf tournaments or having these wonderful events where we're here to honor uh, the best of the best, uh, not only locally, but in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run down a list of the elected officials that are here today. Uh, first off, uh, Congressman Lloyd Doggett. Congressman Doggett is here from, from Austin. Thank you so much. A true champion for, for the cause. Also, uh, sitting on stage with this representative, Joaquin Castro, is going to be speaking with us a little bit later. And I got to say, I, I may be a bit biased. This next guy is my favorite politician, bar none, State Representative Joe Farias, District, <laughs> District 118. I said it right, Dad. Is that, is that how you wanted me to? You jotted it down for me? OK, got it. Uh, boy, our commissioner's court, we've got two, two fantastic commissioners that are here with us. Uh, Commissioner Tommy Atkinson. Tommy, where are you at? Commissioner Atkinson is a true champion. Um, and this next individual is, is absolutely everything that is good and great about the western sector of San Antonio, a true champion working at the courthouse and that's Commissioner Paul Elizondo. We've also got Representative uh, Pete Gallego is here. Representative Gallego is here from uh, Alpine, Texas, making the way all the way down here. Another one of my favorite guys right here, and that's because when you Google Gabe Farias, his big ugly mug will appear on the Walker Report about a dozen or so times. Judge Steve Walker right here. One more time, that's right. Uh, we've got a couple of, of, of fantastic uh, former judges. We've got Judge Al Alonso, who, who's here. Uh, Judge Alonso, thank you so much for coming. And, and also Judge, uh, a great friend, Michael Mary. Judge Mary is, is around here somewhere. We've got uh, a former, I've got him listed as former state representative Justin Rodriguez, but that's, that's not right. Former councilman Justin Rodriguez is here. <laughs> Getting about 20 or so years ahead of myself. I apologize. Uh, we've got Constable Ruben C. Tejeda is here. Constable Tejeda. Thank you so much. And uh, one of my truly best friends, uh, and I can honestly say that, uh, former Councilwoman Jennifer Ramos is here as well. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, boy, that's a pretty distinguished list of, of, of Democrats. Boy, it's kind of a who's who of, of Democrats in this room. I'm, I'm almost frightened to say that if something were to happen to this room, the biggest name in Democratic politics would be like Reed Williams. Start. <laughs> that was my one joke. Is that a, was it okay? No. Just don't tell Reed I said that, please, because he's actually my councilman. Um, you know, I, I've got to uh, acknowledge, uh, acknowledge this, this next uh, individual. Even though she's not an elected official, she meant a lot to the West San Antonio Chamber, and that's former President Mary Cruz. Mary, where are you at? <clears throat> Thank you, Mary. Uh, we've got uh, several board members from some of the... Uh, um, organizations that are here today from the San Antonio Water Systems, uh, Robert Anguiano and Samuel Luna 
Guys, thank you so much for, for coming out today. Come on, you can even clap. You can clap for everybody. Come on. There we go. From the San Antonio River Authority, several individuals that mean a ton to that organization, uh, Robert Rodriguez, Mike Lackey, Robert Ramirez, Olga Liscano, and Adir Sutherland. Thank you so much for coming out from the uh, San Antonio River Authority. From VIA, we have board trustees Gerald Lee, uh, Dr. Richard Gambita, and Lou Miller. Guys, thank you so much. I'm a third of the way down, so just bear with me. I'm, I'm joking. I'm, I'm almost finished. Um, John Rodriguez, where's John at? Boy, what, let me tell you something. When you talk about veterans' causes and when you talk about fighting for veterans, we've got a ton of elected officials that already do that. The one guy in this room who's not an elected official that probably does more, with all due respect, is Mr. John Rodriguez, who sits on the Veterans Commission for District 3. John, thank you so much for all that you do. From Port San Antonio, and I gotta tell you, before I introduce these board members, Port San Antonio means a tremendous amount to the West San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. They're big supporters. Uh, Andrew Anguiano and Maria Elena Toralva Alonso. How can I get your name wrong? Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you so much. Um, only 17 more names. Guys, I gotta recognize our board members, the West San Antonio Chamber. We've got a brand new board and they are just doing fantastic things with this organization. They are involved and they are seeing our projects and our goals and our missions and everything that we have going on. They're seeing a lot of, the, they're seeing everything to fruition and they're doing a fantastic job representing this organization. Uh, Teresita Aguilar from Our Lady of the Lake University. Teresita, where are you at? Thank you so much. Miss Rita Hernandez from Inspiration for Life. Rita. Thank you, Rita. Uh, Mr. John Leal from CPS Energy. John. And our one board member who's not here, Jorge Beltran from Earl and Associates. Guys, thank you so very much for what you guys do and what you guys bring to the table with the West San Antonio Chamber. And I would be remiss if I didn't introduce our wonderful executive director, the spark plug that makes all of this happen, Ms. Crystal Vargas. Crystal, thank you. I was told I could only speak for, four, for five minutes and I think I've spoken for six already. So I'm just gonna say a couple of things about what we have going on with the West Chamber. We've got some great events coming up. Everybody has great events, but we have some fantastic ones, some ones that really are outside the box thinking events. Um, we've got a golf tournament that's coming up June the 16th. I know everybody does a golf tournament, but ours is a little different. We do ours over at Brackenridge Golf Course. Uh, you, you can learn about all these events that we have coming up on westsachamber.org. Uh, our Doctoral Achievement Awards uh, that's coming up later in the year in September is a fantastic uh, award ceremony that we have where we honor individuals that go above and beyond uh, that are uh, JDs and MDs and PhDs. So that's another event that we have that, that it, it really sets itself apart. And our Veterans in Business Awards is gonna be coming up in November. Remember, you can learn about all of these events on our website at westsachamber.org. Um, the one thing that I'm gonna talk about that we're doing differently this year that I can't remember this organization ever doing um, is, you know, we have the events and we help our members and we provide incredible networking opportunities for our members. But one of the things that we're gonna do differently this coming year leading into the next legislative session is that for the first time ever, the West San Antonio Chamber of Commerce is gonna collectively put our minds together, our 385 members that we have. And we're gonna come up with our first ever legislative agenda, and we're gonna to go to Austin, and we're gonna advocate on behalf of our members and our businesses and our partners on how we can make a big difference at the state level in helping our members holistically. We've never done this before, but we have a, a, a group of board members who's excited about really making a difference, whether it's a, a, a hub bill that we're working on to try and improve um, situations for, for our small businesses in the west side, or whether it's, it's, it's going to uh, Austin with a bill that can help our utilities or, or Port San Antonio, we are gonna be there for our members 
like we've never been there for our members in the future. So if you can give a round of applause to the board, uh, the board members, because this is some really <laughs> wonderful outside the box thinking. And if you've heard me speak once, you've heard me speak a million times on this one phrase. Our goal at the West Chamber is to improve the quality of life of our members. That's what we want to do. We want to create opportunities so that our members can build another building or our members can hire another two or three employees. Um, and when you do that and when you accomplish that basic goal of, of being an organization that makes a difference, whether it's making a difference for Port San Antonio or making a difference for you know, Chubby's Auto Sales, who has two locations, then what we, you guys laugh, that's actually a great place to go buy a car. Uh, you know, what we do is we accomplish our goal of trying to improve economic development in the western sector of San Antonio. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce, not to come up and speak, but our last political figure that we have here, big round of applause for Congressman Charles Gonzalez. But guys, go ahead and uh, continue your dinner. We're going to continue with the program here in about five or six minutes. But again, thank you so much for coming out. And on behalf of the West Chamber, we appreciate that all that you guys do for us. Thank you very much.
All right, folks, if I can have your attention, we're going to continue with the program now. Um, the individual that I'm about to call up right now is, is somebody who has been, you know, absolutely and utterly fighting the good fight. And I, I can say this, that the one thing that I dislike about this guy, woohoo, everybody's looking at me, is that he's not going to be in Austin in, in next year. That's the one thing that uh, just absolutely kills me because he has been there and he's been fighting for everyone. And I, I talked a little earlier in the chairman's reception. These guys, they fight for, for individual, it's, it doesn't matter what side of the partisan alley they sit on. They make decisions and policy based on what they feel is the best for us locally and for us here in the state of Texas. And nobody does that better than our next speaker, Representative Joaquin Castro. Good evening. Uh, yeah, thank you, Gabe, uh, for the introduction. And it is so wonderful to be here with everybody from the West Side Chamber, and Crystal and all of the staff from the West Side Chamber who over the years have helped build this organization into what it is today. And also, it's very special for me to be here to, to honor and to introduce uh, such a legend in San Antonio, Charlie Gonzalez. You know, there are, on the west side, a very special part of town for me. It's where my brother and I grew up. I tell people that my upbringing was a tour, literally a tour, of the west side. On the west side of town, there are certain hallmarks that everybody knows. Whether it's Lanier High School, La Tecla, Fox Tech, where my dad went, Guadalupe Street, the mural of Henry B. at Estelas, of those hallmarks, when you think about the names of politicians and public servants who have done so much for our community, there is one name that stands above the rest, and that is Gonzalez. And we, we here today honor not just a man who served in Congress since 1999 and who has done incredible things for our city, but also somebody who is part of such an incredible legacy. I don't have to tell you that this is historic for our city because when Charlie retires from Congress in January of 2013, it really will be the passing of a torch and the, and the closing of a, a long and wonderful chapter in our city. His father, Henry B., was elected in 1961 in a special election. And this city has gone through such incredible and wonderful changes over the years, owing in large part to the work of Henry B. and to the work of Charlie Gonzalez. You think about Charlie's tenure in Congress, over the last, I guess, 13 years it will be, 13, 14 years, almost every single part of our city has changed for the better. Our colleges and universities have grown incredibly. We now enroll over 100,000 students at our colleges and universities, more than Dallas, more than Austin, more than many major American cities. The, the amount of federal money that we've gotten for our colleges and universities has grown incredibly. You think about our economic expansion and how Congressman Gonzalez and others in Texas helped the city react uh, after 1995 when, through BRAC, Kelly Air Force Base, which had ushered thousands of families into the middle class, was closed. And all of the work that, that Charlie has done to make sure that the aerospace industry, that Boeing and Lockheed Martin, Martin and other companies at the port have provided jobs for our city and have continued to grow our economy. There is almost no sector that has been untouched by the work of Charlie Gonzalez. His term in Congress has been a special one. His legacy is one that will go on for a very long time. And it was uh, very bittersweet for me. You know, I've been telling the story on the campaign trail about the day that I heard that Charlie wasn't going to run for re-election. And I hope Charlie won't mind if I tell the story real quick. Uh, it was the day after Thanksgiving, and it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And I had been running for Congress in a different district for about five months at that point. And so this was finally a chance for me to rest. Uh, for, you know, we were going in the, we were in the holiday weekend, and Charlie and I had run into each other down at the federal court, 
and said that we would talk after, after the court came out with a decision, which they had on Wednesday, uh, separating the 35th district and at that time the 25th district of Lloyd Doggett. So Lloyd was happy he was going to be able to run in Austin. Uh, I was happy I was going to be able to run in the new 35th. And then the day after Thanksgiving at 5 o'clock, Charlie called. And I saw that Charlie was calling on my cell phone, and I was asleep. And I said, oh, maybe I'll just call Charlie later. <laughs> well, thank God I answered the phone, because uh, I answered the phone. And Charlie said, Joaquin, I called to tell you that I'm not going to be running for re-election, and that I just told my mom and my family uh, two days ago on Wednesday. And I was still asleep, and I said, you're not going to run for re-election this time? I don't know what other time he'd be talking about. <laughs> Uh, but it woke me up very fast, and it was very bittersweet uh, because, of course, uh, a wonderful opportunity for me uh, as somebody who has grown up on the west side and loves the west side and the 20th district, but also very bittersweet for our city uh, because Charlie has done so much for us. So please help me welcome a wonderful friend, a champion for San Antonio, our very good friend, Charlie Gonzalez. <laughs> Oh, no, thank you. Oh. oh, please be seated. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, I can't thank you. No, please. Uh, I promised people that, that I would attempt to be brief. Uh, the speech always goes a little longer than anticipated, and I promise not to wander off too much. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Joaquin. Uh, I hadn't made up my mind that I would not be seeking re-election. I was consumed by trying to uh, retain the character of the 20th district. Uh, it has always been the true San Antonio Congressional District. Uh, it represented the uh, cultural, social, civic, business centers uh, of our city. Uh, and we were in the middle of a huge court battle. We had a temporary victory, and then, of course, a, a, a setback. But in essence, at that point, when we had the victory, I knew that it was time to make a decision. And what uh, I told Joaquin, uh, that uh, he probably found out that I wasn't going to seek re-election before many of my family members, because the way I set it up was the night before I got my nephew, who has everybody's email address, uh, and I said, okay, you know, don't say anything. And I didn't tell none of my brothers, sisters, anybody. I said, but tomorrow at this specific hour, I want you to start calling the family and telling everybody. And the reason is because <clears throat> I knew that as soon as the release went out, uh, it, it was going to be out there. I wanted family to know first. But the first person that I personally called was Joaquin. And the reason for that is that Joaquin had the courage and conviction to get out there and seek a congressional seat in what was a very, very difficult one that had been configured by the Texas State Legislature. And so I figured if anyone has earned the decision to switch to what we call the San Antonio congressional seat, it was Joaquin. So I called Joaquin right away. <clears throat> uh, I couldn't tell that you were sleepy or anything, Joaquin, but. Uh, <laughs> But I could tell that, that you, uh, it was decision time and that you needed to start talking to family and friends and supporters. But uh, you know, my prediction is that <clears throat> as I leave in January, Joaquin will be raising his right hand and will be elected to the United States Congress. <clears throat> and for all of you that have worked closely with me and my staff, I can tell you now there is no doubt that that relationship will continue and this city will continue to prosper. And there's so many folks out there that I would individually say thank you for everything that you've done for San Antonio. Uh, first of all, Crystal, thank you again for your hard work, Gabe, your leadership to the board of directors of the West San Antonio Chamber. Look, everything starts in our own backyard. Our family, our neighborhood, expands to the community and so on. And that's what the West San Antonio Chamber of Commerce is all about. Uh, being involved with our local small businessmen uh, in, in a certain area that is expanding, of course, and it's a greater challenge, but you're assuming it and doing it very well. So I want to thank you. I also wish to extend, because uh, I, I always try to do it, but once in a while I would forget, but since this is going to be my last state of the district address, 
I, um, many of you will come up to me and say, oh, thank you for this and thank you for that. And Joaquin will tell you that it really is staff that makes any member uh, truly effective. I want to thank all the members of my staff that are here tonight, and I would ask if they would please stand, and that includes our interns that don't get paid. <laughs> if you'll please stand, uh, I want to recognize them. My father uh, prided himself on having constituent service a second to none, and, and uh, I inherited some of his great staff that still work with me, uh, and I've just been truly blessed. Uh, they gave me guidance, they, they told me how to actually do things, and they recognized, uh, uh, they would say, well, who is that? And say, no, that is someone that, that had a veteran's claim, but now it's gonna be Social Security and so on. And so I even got to meet constituents that had been close to my father and that we continued to help. And that's probably the greatest uh, satisfaction that anyone could ever have. Uh, I always try to start off with a little bit of humor. <clears throat> As you already know, uh, things have not been that humorous in Washington. I used to be able to come back and, and tell you about some stories that were quite funny, but <clears throat> you know, it's gotten to be a, a very serious place, it, but not in a good way. And I'll touch on that in a minute. And I do want to discuss a very disturbing topic and trend uh, that we're experiencing not just nationally but even locally which is the strangest thing that the character of San Antonio and its composition that we somehow are being um, affected uh, by the debate on immigration but I will start with a little bit <clears throat> of humor real quick some of you may have already heard some of this when the SA to DC trip uh, a month ago or whatever <clears throat> But last summer, we had a big debate on whether we needed to increase the debt ceiling. It was an absolute no-brainer. It had always been done because it was for past debts. I mean, you remember the debate. People were very upset. They didn't know we were going to default. Our credit rating system was going to be impacted and such. So there was a poll, and the poll showed at that point in time, on July the 30th, 2011, that Republican members of Congress had a 33% approval rating rating, and Democrats in Congress had a 33% uh, poll approval rating. Now, you would say that's really low. Well, it's lower today than it was back then. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> it is, it's still in double digits. The problem is one of the digits is a zero. So we're <laughs> it's not good. But people were saying, oh, that is just horrible, 33%. I said, wait a minute. In that poll, they actually asked the following question. If you believe in God, how do you feel about the job God is doing? God only got a 52% approval rating. <laughs> so I figured we're only doing 19% at that point worse than God. That's not bad. I mean, but that goes to show you, and I, and I see Professor Gambetta back there, because he used to conduct these type of, uh, uh, of polls. Uh, the other thing is, uh, so during that same period of time, they would be interviewing people and asking them, well, how do you feel? And they'd say, well, I'm filled with anxiety. I don't know what to do. You know, it's going to be the end of the world. Uh, and, and I don't mean to minimize it because it was a serious issue. So they interviewed this retiree, and they said, well, how do you feel? And he says, well, I used to be a cautious optimist, but now I'm a confused pessimist. <laughs> and this is my advice to, to uh, Joaquin. Uh, Washington can be a very difficult place. You don't have to agree with the people, uh, but you need to be working together. But Barney Frank has a way of saying it differently than that, and this is what uh, Barney said, if you're seeking office, uh, United States Congress, quote, if you're not able to work closely with people you despise, you can't really work here. <laughs> and the last thing is that we don't take ourselves sometimes too seriously especially the political part, you know, the talking heads, all the different programs, you'll get invited, Joaquin, and, you know, they want you to say something outrageous, and they want to take everything incredibly serious, and, and it's got to be divisive and, and such. And this is the way uh, George Will had an article, and he quoted Eugene McCarthy, and he says, being in politics, said Eugene McCarthy, is like coaching football. You have to be smart enough to understand the game and dumb enough to think it's important. <laughs> and there are very important things that we do in Congress, and there's some things that aren't as important, but we elevate them 
and it gets in the way of the debate. My topic tonight is a very serious one, and I'm going to try to get through this because I know that it's, as we refer to a Wednesday nights as school night, meaning we all have to go to work tomorrow. And my final state of the district address is why is the national debate on immigration, how it impacts all Latinos, the undocumented and the citizen alike, and how we resolve the issue will determine the future, not just of our Latino communities, but of our nation. Uh, and it's a heavy topic, and it's a serious topic, but there's so much at stake. And we should <clears throat> be very familiar with its nature, and we should try to figure out the answers, and San Antonio and Texas can be role models if we really want it to. We don't like discussing this. I understand that, because it's a difficult one and a disturbing issue. But the immigration debate regarding the undocumented spills over to all Latino citizens in this country. You don't have to look any further than here in San Antonio. Explain to me how a basketball team outside of Austin can come and play Lanier and start chanting USA, USA, and Arizona, Arizona. Explain to me how an Alma Heights basketball game against my alma mater, Edison, where you have a group of kids also chanting USA, USA. In San Antonio, Texas, you don't tell me that immigration debate is not filtering down and impacting everyone. And maybe they start feeling a certain way and have always felt a certain way, but it seems to give them license to express it publicly. And it's destructive. It truly is. The chants are directed at players because of their ethnicity, which is equated to illegal status, which is seen as license to publicly express prejudice and bigotry. And that's very harsh, isn't it? I don't think that it is. It's truthful. And this is where our educators have an opportunity to do something. My fear is that nothing will get done, because it's unpleasant. What do you deal? How do you speak to a child and say, why did you say that? What motivated you? What is your idea of what is going on in this country? Why do you think of that brown-skinned opponent as someone less than you? At 66 years of age, and, for, and Paul, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We've seen it, but we thought we had really progressed. The question is, have we really progressed, and where are we today? For San Antonio, a majority-minority city, for Texas, a majority-minority state, and for Latinos in general, we say that the issue of immigration is important, but that it is not the top issue. And Joaquin understands this because we get pigeonholed. They'll invite Joaquin to go and talk, but only about immigration. They'll invite me, but only about immigration. And at some point, you really feel you know, limited by the fact that you are Latino and they just want to talk about immigration. We want to talk about education. We want to talk about health care. We want to talk about jobs and having a skill set that allows us to be relevant in a global economy. We want to talk about Social Security. We want to talk about Medicare. We want to talk about national defense. And so I always felt, and even as chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, I always felt, you know what? I actually know something about energy. I actually know something about telecommunications. I actually know something about health care. And they just want to talk about immigration. But you know what I've realized? That you have to talk about comprehensive immigration reform because it will impact all those other issues that are so important to us as a Latino community, but to the entire United States, whether you're Latino or not. And this <clears throat> is the whole thrust of my address tonight. It's not a Latino-specific issue. It is a United States issue. So let's start off with the realities of demographics. By 2050, the Latino population will triple, while the non-Hispanic white population will remain essentially flat. In an October 2011 Express News article, uh, William H. Fry, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, and Dow Myers, urban planner from the University of Southern California, were cited for the following. 
The 2010 census showed Hispanics accounted for all U.S. population growth of children under 18 years of age since 2000. Under 18 years of age, Anglo population declined by over 4 million in the past decade. During that same period of time, the Hispanic under 18 years of age population grew by nearly 5 million. Only 51% of the United States population under five years of age is Anglo. A quarter of the entire group is Hispanic. 73% of the nation's 50 to 64 year old population is Anglo. From the Department of Labor, Hispanics represent one out of every three new workers entering the United States workforce in 2011. By 2025, that number will increase to one in every two new workers. Now, what about the reality and the inevitable consequences of those figures that I just tossed out to you? Well, Mr. Fry makes the following comment. Quote, this trend undoubtedly brings some challenges of racial generation gaps. The disconnect between older white and a younger, more diverse population who may not understand where their interests intersect. And we've done a horrible job of doing that. If anything, we don't have that discussion, how we must rely on one another. I just read to you what should be some really startling demographics. And we have not made a point to those that are fearful of this new majority that their future rests with that new ma majority. It really does. Now, Dal Myers, what his observation was, if not for the rapid infusion of immigrants and their children into the United States population, the U.S. would likely fall victim to the same stagnation in economic and population growth found in other industrialized countries such as Japan where the birth rate is too low to sustain the dependent elderly population projected to retire in the coming years. So what does Ron Brownstein is writing in the National Journal? Now just remember what Mr. Myers just said about the elderly population projected to retire. This is what Mr. Brownstein cites. Social Security and Medicare serve 40 million beneficiaries today. By 2030, it will serve 80 million, 80 million. Four-fifths of today's seniors are white, and that proportion will not change for decades. So you make the conclusion. You make the connection, and we're not making it, and we're not explaining to people why we are invested, invested in each other. I'm going to throw out some other facts. And this kind of basically tells you the challenge. 227,500 children born here last year in the United States had at least one parent who was an illegal Mexican immigrant. This is Robert Smith of City University in New York. Quote, the key to what kind of citizen those children will become is how they are being educated and incorporated now. Incorporated, I would have used assimilated. How they're educated and how they're assimilated. He didn't say tomorrow, he didn't say in 10 years, he said now. We're behind, we're behind, and terrible consequences await us if we don't speed up the process. There was a Harvard study by Irokasu Yoshikawa and this was cited in a New York Times editorial of May 27, 2011. Professor Yoshikawa estimates that four million preschool-age children of immigrants are American citizens. Their hindered development will haunt this country. There is a price to pay for our ignorance and for avoiding facing the reality. So how do we respond to this reality? Let's start off with education. And the reason I say education is because a lot of people just believe that the sheer numbers of Latinos, that the sheer weight and quantity of Latinos will break down that door to opportunity 
and to responsibility, because we know with opportunity goes responsibility, because we know that with opportunity, people expect more of us. That door will not open by the sheer weight of numbers. It will not. It's better to find the key that unlocks the door to opportunity, but we have to be prepared to take advantage of that opportunity and then assume our rightful responsibility as residents and citizens of this great country. So what do we do about education? Recognizing the challenge, what have we done? Texas is and should be a poster child for the opportunities and challenges that minority populations and immigration present, both legal and illegal migration. By 2013, Texas will have 185,000 additional students as compared when the Texas legislature last passed the budget. And Joaquin's an expert on this because when I was researching this, his quotes were all over the place about the shortfall. There was a story in the news, Express News back in April the 4th of last year. The debate's going on. We know what's going to happen with education. An education staffer said it would be the first cut in, in the foundation school program since its 1949 enactment. Follow-up story, August 20th, 2011, Express News. In the last decade, school en enrollment in Texas grew by 874,000. State leaders in adopting the two-year budget in, the in 2011 bragged, quote, that lawmakers had appropriated more money for education than ever appropriated. And Joaquin knows that is not an accurate statement. He didn't support that budget on education, and I'm incredibly proud of the majority of the, our state delegation that fought these cuts. <clears throat> and thank you, Joaquin. I've been at gatherings where state officials get up and make the representation that there is more money than it has been appropriated in the last session than ever before, historically speaking. So how do, you, how do you reconcile that with the reality? Paul Colbert, school finance expert and former state legislator, was interviewed and he said, while Texas has increased general spending for public education by about $10.5 billion from 2002 to 2003, compared to the 2012-2013 cycle, however, public education funding actually is $537 less per student than it was four years ago. They didn't do the math. Yes, you appropriate more money, but not enough to address the increased enrollment of students. But it's a fact. You can still say we've appropriated more money than we ever have before. Now, it comes out to be less per student, but who's checking? Now, you might say, well, who's this Paul Colbert? You know, probably a former Democratic state legislator. Well, I'll just go ahead and quote the Republican Texas Education Commissioner Robert Scott, February 6, 2012. Commissioner Scott apologized to the Texas Association of School Administrators for the legislature's decision to cut per student spending in Texas for the first time since World War II and for cutting $1 billion out of his agency's programs that have proven successful in boosting student achievement. That's from within the administration. So what are we doing at the federal level? Not much better. We all know that at the federal level, we probably provide 7 to 8% of school funding. The rest is going to be state and local. But what we do well and what we've done and we've improved on in the past four years have been on federal grants and student loans. And I know that I have my university folks here. You know exactly what I'm talking about that are essential for students to attend college. Texas student aid sources for fiscal year 2009, those are the numbers that I could find recently. In other words, where are the funds for the students either by way of grants or loans in order to allow them the opportunity to go to college? At the federal level, we provide $44.7 billion or 74% of all monies available. Institutions provide 970 million or 
the state provides 447 million or 7%, and then other sources provide about 287 million or about 4%. What about Pell Grants? I know I've got my university officials here. You know what a Pell Grant is. Locally, Our Lady of the Lake has about 63% of its student body that receives a Pell Grant. St. Mary's, about 53%. The University of the Incarnate Word, about 41%. So what are we doing at the federal level? We're going to increase the interest rate that we charge students for student loans, and we're going to reduce the monies available for Pell Grants. We are going to make it more difficult for those kids to go to college, to find that key that will open the door to opportunity. So what has been the political response to the need for comprehensive immigration reform so that we can educate everyone and we can assimilate into mainstream American society? It has not been good. Texas attempted to pass the sanctuary city legislation as an emergency item. We had SB 1070 in Arizona that is going to be argued before the Supreme Court in three weeks. We've had HB 56 in Alabama, which is even worse than SB 1070 in Arizona. And I've been to Alabama. And I can tell you the purpose of that law. And we've had the introduction of similar legislation in many other states. The national debate, nothing but opposition to, congr to comprehensive immigration reform, using fear, anxiety, and the insecurity of, that the recession has visited on our society. This approach, the political approach, what we're doing with education, not only ignores finding solutions that work in the best economic interests of our country, but engenders prejudice that extends beyond the undocumented, but touches and impacts all Latinos. Many of you are going to disagree with some of the things that I say here. I sincerely believe it. Unfortunately, I think it's going to play out this way, unless we find the common ground, unless we understand that we are a community and we will have to depend on one another. But you ask me, why the disconnect? Why are we making the association? Why are we doing this with education? Why are we doing this with Dream Kids? Why are we doing this with the lack of comprehensive immigration reform? Harold Myerson, on July 13th, in a Post article, wrote as follows, and I'm paraphrasing. There are those, to be sure, have long waged the war on government. But only now has it become an uh, apocalyptic and total war. At its root, I suspect, is the fear and loathing that many rank and file members feel towards their own government and their nation, that it is inexorably becoming multiracial multicultural, cosmopolitan, and now headed by a president who personifies those qualities. That America is also downwardly mobile is a challenge to all of us. But for some people, the anxiety that our economy evokes is augmented by the politics of racial resentment and the fury that the country is no longer theirs. That's not a country whose government they want to pay for. And if the apocalypse befalls us, they seem to have concluded so much the better. That's what's really going on in this country. I think that was the best description that I had read. And somehow public officials seem to be feeding on this and even getting elected on it, and it is destructive. But there's also a simple political calculation. And this is State Representative Leo Berman from Tyler, who introduced Arizona SB 1070 type legislation in the Texas legislature. His comment on what would happen if we had comprehensive immigration reform or some pathway to legal, legalization and citizenship. Quote, there's 25 million in the United States. You can't listen to 8 million to 12 million numbers that come out of Washington every day. You're going to create an instant 25 million Democrats. He actually said that. Or maybe it's something as old, and, I, and I, a minute ago I, I, I said I was 66. Paul remembers the, the days, as many of you also remember. It could be something, too, that is as old as human nature. This is Michael Garrison talking about the DREAM Act. And he's a Republican. I, I really respect his writings. This is back in December of 2010 
After the November election, and we lost the House, reduced the numbers as Democrats in the Senate, we passed the DREAM Act out of the House. It went to the Senate. We had 55 votes. You had a majority. We would have the DREAM Act today, but for the filibuster. But what Michael Garrison said was as follows, quote, whatever its legislative fate, the DREAM Act is effective at stripping away pretense. Opponents of this law don't want earned citizenship for any illegal immigrant, even those personally guilty of no crime, even those who demonstrate their skills and character. The DREAM Act would be a potent incentive for assimilation. But for some, assimilation clearly is not the goal. They have no intention of sharing the honor of citizenship with anyone called illegal. Even those who came as children have grown up as neighbors and would be willing to give their lives in the nation's cause. And things have only gotten worse since December 2010. We have a chance here in San Antonio to set the example for the state, Joaquin, then Texas has a chance to set the example for the entire United States. If we don't come to grips to this, I'm not really sure where we go as a nation. Because I, I will remind you about the demographics, the numbers that I cited to you. Does anybody understand that that younger generation is truly the answer to the future? We've always understood that. Why are we blind now? Is it some other kind of bias or prejudice? What is the fear? I'm not real sure. I've quoted certain writers, and I think they're on to something. I don't know how we're going to do this. Now, I remain hopeful. I leave Congress. Joaquin's going to be there. He's going to be championing comprehensive immigration reform, education, the DREAM Act. And I am hopeful, Joaquin. I think you'll be successful in time. Two reasons. One, I'm hoping that economic necessity will eventually lead us to a system that will promote education and assimilation. This is like the civil rights movement when John Lewis, who I've had the great, great honor of serving in Congress, who used to march with Martin Luther King, and what they used to say back in the civil rights movement, and what African Americans faced during that point in history. And John would always say, we may have come here on different ships yesterday, but we are in the same boat today. <laughs> and then I still remain an optimist after 14 years, Joaquin. And so I expect that you will too. And I still am an idealist. And I do believe in America's basic humanity and that it will prevail, that the best will still come out in all of us, that we make mistakes and then we correct them, that we're willing to admit maybe believing something that was not constructive or positive and moving in a different direction. I'm going to leave you with this last thought. And this is the idealistic part, but I really believe it about the humanity part. I serve with a congressman who is chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus by the name of Emmanuel Cleaver. He's just a wonderful man. Every couple of weeks, he sends every member of Congress a short letter in which he recites some experience or story. Of course it's not partisan. He sends it to everyone because he understands we need to be communicating. And this is what he said back in December of 2011. He said, Dear Charlie, as a great seminar professor was holding court with some of his best students, he asked, how would you know when the darkness has been subdued and the dawning of a new day begins? One bright and articulate student said, Professor, I will know that the darkness ends and a dawning begins when I can look into the distance and distinguish a dog from a sheep. The professor said, I'm sorry, that is not the correct answer. Another student said, it is when in the distance I tell the difference between a peach and an apple tree. 
That is a very good answer, replied the professor, but it is not the correct answer. Finally, one student said, Professor, it is obvious that we do not know the answer to your question. Please tell us. And this is what the professor said. Well, answered the professor, we can tell the dawn is arrived when in the distance we see a human figure and recognize that it is a brother or a sister. My wish for you, the West San Antonio Chamber, to my city, to my state, and to my nation, and for everyone's sake, <clears throat> that we see that dawn in America sooner rather than later. Thank you very, very much. He is truly our Congressman, Charlie Gonzalez. Charlie, thank you so very much, Congressman, for all that you've done. Uh, of course, we gotta give him something. Hang, hang tight, guys, just give me, give me two minutes. We're gonna present him with something. What do you give an individual who's pretty much gotten just about everything you could possibly get, a plaque? What do you give him? Uh, we voted and we chose a Harley. But, Congratulations. but we realized we didn't have the money in the budget for a Harley. So what we wanted to give you is we have a local artist here in the, in the Western sector, Blas Hernandez, and we wanted to give you something that you can actually use and hang on your wall. Yeah, but we've got a, a, a original painting from Blas Hernandez, local West Side artist, on behalf of the West Chamber. Yeah, for, from all from all, for all that you do. But another thing that that we're going to honor Congressman Gonzalez with, and and we made this decision, the board did here recently. Uh, we want to make sure, obviously, his legacy is going to live on for, forever. Uh, but we want to do our part in continuing that legacy. So starting in September at our doctoral awards, we're going to name our first ever, and this is going to be an annual award, uh, a Charles Gonzalez Western Sector Person of the Year Award. And we're going to give our first award in September in honor of all of the accomplishment that you have done. Uh, it's going to be based on accomplishment and diligence in promoting and doing great things in the western sector of San Antonio. So that's something we're going to be doing sometime in September. So again, Congressman, for all that you do and all that you've done, thank you, thank you, thank you. One more round of applause for Congressman thank Gonzalez. You. Guys, i got two more quick announcements, and then you can go home. Announcement number one, Spurs 87, Boston Celtics 86. That's a final, so we won tonight. And uh, I need to announce one more person that was here, and I forgot. I can't believe it. She's a, a big part of our board. Uh, Grace Rodriguez Elliott. Grace, I know she's here from Broadway Bank. Thank you so very much. Uh, guys, thank you so much for coming out. WestSAChamber.org for pictures on this event. One more round of applause for Congressman Gonzalez, and then you can go home. Good night, everybody.